Greetings to all of our friends around the world and welcome once again to Kourou, the home of the Ariane family for today's live broadcast of Ariane Space Flight number 234. It's an international launch, a double launch, the sort of mission that for many years now has been the staple and the specialty of the Ariane 5 vehicle. We're happy you could join us. To get us underway, we're going to go first for some opening words to Ariane Space Chairman and CEO, Stefan Israel. Stefan? So, ladies and gentlemen, Ariane Space is delighted to welcome you from the Guyana Space Center for this new Ariane 5 mission, the seventh and last of the year with our heavyweight vehicle. In a few minutes, we are going to launch two key satellites for two major regional operators and close customers. Star One D1 for the Brazilian operator Embratel Star One and GCSAT 15 for the Japanese operator SkyPerfect GSAT. Both satellites have been manufactured by our long standing partner SSL. So thanks to Embratel Star One and to SkyPerfect GSAT for your continuous trust. As you can see, on the control screen behind me, Ariane 5 is on the launch pad after having been transferred yesterday. All the operations linked to the final condon went well. So we should be in a position, if the weather is okay, but the weather is okay, to launch at 5.30 p.m. The launch window will last one hour and 15 minutes. The overall performance to GTO required for this launch is 10,722 kilograms. As you know, the liftoff occurs seven seconds after the H0 at the initiation of the boosters. Ion 5 will then head towards the east to separate the satellites on an elliptical orbit inclined at six degrees with respect to the equatorial plane. The perigee altitude will be 250 kilometers and the apogee altitude will be 35,905 kilometers. Star 1D1 will separate first, 29 minutes after liftoff, and Skype GSAT 15 will then separate 43 minutes after liftoff. So our launch is now just a few minutes away. So go Ariane 5, go Star. 1D1, go GCSAT 15, and for sure, enjoy the show. Thank you. Stefan, many thanks. Stefan will be back, of course, at the close of the broadcast for some final words. We want to set the scene for you. The launcher is ready. Let's begin by taking a look at these green status panels on the right there. A lot of activities are needed to launch and prepare and follow Ariane 5 or Soyuz or Vega and all these activities are summarized by these green status panels and all is green for now so all is go. The launcher, there are two versions, this one 54 meters uh, tall, there are in two composites, a lower and an upper and we will describe each in turn as it is functioning. Our two passengers, Star 1D1, the heavier satellite in the upper berth and JSAT JC set below that. We have more on the upper passenger, Star 1D1, in a short film coming up for you now. Welcome to Kourou Space Center. The A234 Ion 5 flight uh, will be a very special event, not only because it will be the last Ion 5 flight of the year, but also because it will be the 11th Ambratel Star 1 satellite launched by Ion Space. Ambratel is the satellite operator leader for the South America market and we are particularly proud of the confidence Star 1 puts in Ariane Space Systems reliability. This Star 1, D1, will be our largest satellite in orbit. D1 is the second satellite constructed by Space System Loral for Star 1. It will be located at 84 degrees west position and is equipped with C, KU, KA band transponder covering Brazil, Latin America, and North America. As per D1 features, we will be able to offer a large scale of telecommunication service to our customers. Outside, waiting. Back inside, as we're setting the stage, we want to present some of the key players who make the mission happen. The satellite teams are here in Jupiter with their Ariane Space Program directors, Frank 
Danu you saw in the film, and his customers from Star One. Alongside them, Christophe Bardou and his people for JCSAT. The Area and Space Program Director is the direct liaison between the customer and Area and Space. We saw a short film on our first passenger, and our first look at our second passenger, JCSAT 15. The relationship between Sky Perfect JSAT and Iron Space is a long standing one. It started a little more than 30 years ago when Sky Perfect signed the launch services agreement with Iron Space for its very first satellite, JSAT 1, which was then launched on the third Iron 4. Since then, Sky Perfect has constantly renewed its confidence in Iron Space by entrusting us several of its uh, satellites. Skypath JSAT operate two satellites at uh, 110 degree east longitude. And SAT 110 and uh, JC SAT 110 hour, uh, which provide a multi -cha uh, channel pay TV service in Japan, Sky Perfect TV. JC SAT 15 is a foreign satellite for the NSAT 110. Once it begins its service, JC SAT 15 will be called JC SAT 110A and uh, it will expand the uh, uh, our ultra high definition TV broadcasting service capability in Japan and uh, its data communication service area in the India, Indian Ocean and the Oceania region. Just over seven minutes to go until liftoff. Some other key players, this is the Ariane Space High Command called the Flight Desk, heading up the team Stefan Israel. With him, Roland Lagier, the Chief Technical Officer, they will make the call should anything unexpected come up, either before or during the mission. Another person you're going to be seeing today, and especially hearing his voice, is the Range Operations Manager, also called the DDO. And he will shortly call out... The DDO, attention for the sequence final lanceur. And that is his voice, Raymond Boyce, going to call out the seven-minute mark. Top, I zero my seven minutes. He has announced a seven-minute mark, which brings us into what is called the synchronized sequence or the automatic sequence. It's a key milestone and represents the final moments of the final countdown. It's a complex series of operation running right down to liftoff, gradually letting the launcher become autonomous as power passes from the ground computers to the onboard computers. A film for you now on the launch campaign. You can see how Ariane 5 is ready for her mission. Take a look. We'll be back. As usual, coming from Europe after an 11 day trip, the launcher stages arrive in Kourou. Preparation began with the EPC and the two solid rocket boosters. The upper charging stage with the VIB was then mated. The launch operation on Ariane 5, launcher number 587 of Flight 224, began on the integration beginning on November 2. The launch vehicle was then transferred to the final assembly building November the 30th. JCSAT-15 landed at Felix Ebue Airport on the 27th of October. It was transferred directly to the S5C building. As requested by SSL, the campaign started 15 days earlier to optimize resources. After fluid checks and some additional contingency activities, the propellant filling operations were performed without anomaly on the 19th and 22nd of November in s 3 building. After the flight meeting and the adapter the day after, GCSAT-15 started a three weeks standby phase. The upper passenger, Star 1D1, arrived at the airport on the 14th of November. It was transferred directly to the S5C building and started its electrical checkout. After the transfer from S5C to S5A through the clean corridor, the propellant filling operations were performed without anomaly on the 7th and 9th of December. Star 1 G1, the upper payload, was first in assembly building, mated on top of the SILDA and integrated inside the nose ferry. GCSAT 15, 
the inner payload was then transferred to the assembly building and integrated on top of the launcher. Then, covered with the fairings, in order to finalize the upper composite. L'assemblage complet du lanceur a pu alors se poursuivre. Donc ce vol 234. The flight 234 is the Ariane Space 11th launch of the year. It is also the seventh Ariane 5 in 2016, and we are preparing in the integration building the first Ariane 5 for 2017. Première Ariane 5, dont le lancement est prévu début 2017. Joshua Jample here back in the broadcast booth. One thing they did not mention in the launch campaign film, the Space Systems Loral team began the campaign 15 days earlier than expected on JSAT-15. They finished the satellite in Palo Alto, stored it here to get a head start to begin work on Star 1D1. This because they had five, count them, five launches in December at four different sites around the world, all in the same week. We spoke to Grant Gould this morning, he told us all about the Strive for Five campaign, part of the best year ever for SSL for a number of launches, so good work. Ariane Space 2 having a big year, we'll talk about that later <coughs> on. We're coming to you live from the Jupiter Mission Control Building, but another place that's very busy is the launch zone, where the launch management teams are working under the direction of Jean-Pierre Barlet today. You just saw him, he's the director of the launch operations set up up there. Right now, two teams are working. One is responsible for the ground operations, the other for readiness of the area in five. The launch operations manager heads up one group. He coordinates with mission control here in Jupiter for the final authorization to launch. And when all the conditions are right, he then okays the automatic sequence at the seven minute mark, which we saw. In all, about 100 people up there, hard at work at launch control. Coming up on two minutes to go until the launch of the 90th Ariane 5 mission. Here in Jupiter, the VIPs and invited guests are very shortly going to start to make their ways outside to watch the liftoff. There are two terraces here on either side of the building that give a fine view onto the pad. And if the skies are clear, they will have quite a sight. Now, you're asking about the weather. Today, the weather has been the best it's been all week. We've had a lot of rain, but we should have a quiet and a beautiful launch tonight. This is a split-screen image of the propellant feeder arms, liquid oxygen on the right, liquid hydrogen on the left. They're putting propellant into the upper stage tanks. Those are the yellow bars in the middle of the screen. And you'll see them pull back at minus five seconds before ignition. So we, uh, it's one of the last things you'll see before liftoff, so we just like to mention it. Coming up on a minute to go, you hear the DDO call out that milestone. A tous de DDO, attention pour moins une minute. Stop, I zero, moins une minute. So we are into the final 60 seconds. Give us a chance to say hello to all of our friends in Japan at Sky Perfect JCSAT, early morning for you. In Rio for Embertail Star One, early evening. SSL teams in Palo Alto at just past noon. Hello to Airbus Safran launchers in French Guiana and in Europe and to all our industrial partners and to all of you following on the internet. We hope you're enjoying it. We're going to cut away, let you listen to the DDO as he calls out the final seconds. Watch for the arms to open, which will get the ignition sequence rolling. A tous de DDO, attention pour le décante final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top Allumage PC. Allumage de ZAP, décollage. Well, 
at 17.30 local time and right on time, you saw Ariane 5 began her mission lifting off perfectly from the ground here in French Guiana with a lot of fire, beginning her mission the 11th and last this year, as the DDO says all is well on board, carrying two new telecommuni telecommunication satellites for major regional operators. Beautiful shots. The two boosters are providing 90, that's 9-0, percent of our thrust right now, propelling the launcher along her trajectory at an ever higher velocity. 780, 780 tons at liftoff. She's burning five tons of fuel every second. That's two and a half tons burning in each booster, plus another 300 kilos per second of fuel burning in the core stage. Ariane 5 now following the program and the onboard computer, which gives all the orders, nominal, nominal. stage separation, which we'll begin to see. The DDO says all is well on board. We're in the first of four flight phases. We'll describe each in turn, so you can follow Ariane across the Atlantic eastward. Right now, the first flight phase, the single Vulcan core stage engine and the two boosters are burning. Boosters will burn for another 20 seconds, roughly, and the, with the clear skies we have, you should see them flame out and even fall away from the mothership. The parameters are normal, trajectory nominal. And you'll hear the DDO call out that milestone as well. He will call out separation of the boosters. There, it looks like the extinction of the boosters. Believe it is. Yes, you can see them. That's the Ariane ship continuing her mission, and the two boosters have flamed out above on either side. That's a wonderful picture there. DDO has confirmed separation of the two boosters. They will fall 500 kilometers from shore into a protected area. French Guiana, in part, chosen as a base for its opening on the water. More on that. Coming up. Separation is given by two pyrotechnic systems. On the bottom of your screen, our speed and our altitude. Altitude on the left, we're over a hundred kilometers up, and our speed a little over two kilometers per second. Separation, la Separation of the fairing. DDO has confirmed it. One half you see on the left, there's another half on the right, which is out of camera range. Exposing to the elements our first passenger, star one, that's the blue box there, the blue and white box. We can separate the fairing now because we're out of the dense layers of the atmosphere at over 100 kilometers up. There's neither friction nor heating, which could disturb the passenger. We could also discard any dead weight to maximize the launcher's operation. There are several versions of the fairing available. Tonight we're using the long one, 17 meters tall. So we are into the second powered flight phase. The boosters have done their work, only the single lower stage engine burning now. It'll continue to burn for a total of nine minutes. And our speed is important because that's the role of the main stage. This uh, cryogenic system is not only highly efficient, but provides a push that can last a long time. There are two different propulsion systems on Ariane 5. There's cryogenics, as used in the main stage, generally more efficient than the solid propellant used in the boosters. Basically, the solids are for getting us off the ground and away from the pull of the Earth. Le pilotage est calme, la trajectoire est nominale. Cryogenics are for more precision orienting of the vehicle, and they allow a stage to be reignited, not in this version of the Ariane 5, but in another one. Ariane 5, of course, the heavy lift launcher. The other two members of the Ariane space family, Soyuz, lifting middle-sized payloads two and three tons, roughly speaking. And Vega, which is the light lift vehicle for missions of one ton roughly, and sometimes less than that. If you just joined us, we've had a successful launch. 
of Arian Space, flight number 234. On board are two passengers, Star One and JC Set. We're going to a replay now, what will we hope be several replays. You can re-experience those intense moments as Arian 5 took off from the pad just under six minutes ago. We have cameras at several of the half dozen sites that are stationed across the base and they furnish us with shots from different angles. We should have more footage later on. The closest observation site is called Toucan and many of the VIPs are out there tonight. There's another, I think this might be from, this is from closer than the Toucan. The Toucan is closest to the base, about four kilometers away, two miles roughly. And when Ariane 5 lifts off from there, lights up the whole place. We are shortly going to be picked up by our first downrange tracking station. That'll be over the border in Brazil. The DDO continues to report that all is well on board. We had a beautiful launch and we are having a flawless flight. Il reste moins de deux minutes de propulsion de l'EPC. Burn the propellant in the first stage. The DDO, DDO says there will be about two more minutes. Ariane's trajectory has been designed, of course, to be followed from the ground. The launcher is sending radar and telemetry back, and a network of stations is keeping constant watch on the health of her systems. This telemetry, as we have another replay, Telemetry is launch vehicle data, information on over a thousand parameters being collected and transmitted back to the ground stations every second by two transmitters inside the vehicle equipment bay. That's the white band just under the black bell-shaped structure there in the vehicle. Also telemetry being sent down by antennas outside the Ariane 5. They are recording all her functions throughout the flight. Other data are analyzed in real time. Recording all our functions, everything from motor shutdowns to stage Brazil. Customers can get immediate information on about their spacecraft thanks to this uh, setup, which is very important. Other data are analyzed uh, after the flight to learn how the vehicle has there's usually a complete analysis using the, these data takes uh, takes place about a week after each launch this is how we validate how the vehicle performed on its mission now you can imagine the enormous archives this gives Arian space a wealth of technical information going back to the very first launch of Ariane Ariane 1 1979 Christmas Eve we're in the second powered flight phase, the single engine core stage burning now and about to shut off. You'll see on the left the little blue flame on the animation shut off and it just has. And the DDO confirms it. And separation de l'EPC. Of the lower stage and ignition, as you saw, of the upper stage motor. All these three commands given by the onboard computer de in the on given by the onboard computer in about 13 seconds. After separation, the lower stage falls into the Pacific off the coast of Peru. And we are now in the third powered flight phase, the single upper stage engine that will burn until plus 2520, or for 15 minutes roughly in all. With separation of the lower stage, Ariane 5 has used up all of its 175 tons of propellant that was in the lower stage and has lost another 14,000 kilos of dry mass, which was the lower stage. She also has lost uh, 240 tons of fuel in each booster, which she burned up earlier. So most of her weight, as you will have realized, is propellant. Nominal. The job of the upper stage is to take the satellites to their injection point, position them for separation, and then release them into space. That's its propulsion role. But she also has a second role, 
and that comes during Ariane 5's ballistics phase, comes later on in the flight, and we'll have more on that in a moment. If you just joined us, Ariane 5's last mission of the year, her 11th flight going smoothly. With ignition of the upper stage, we're into the latter half of the mission, and we can focus on the satellites. SSL is a leading provider of commercial satellites, designing and manufacturing spacecraft that help deliver entertainment, information, and critical data around the world. With today's increasing demand for telecommunications infrastructure, satellites built by SSL enable its customers to expand their business services, including direct-to-home television, video content distribution, broadband internet, mobile communications, and Earth observation. The SSL 1300 platform, which is the foundation for SSL's geostationary satellites, provides high power and extensive flexibility while supporting numerous applications and sophisticated technology options for SSL's customers. SSL has formed strong and lasting partnerships worldwide while also growing its customer base. This is a testament to both the quality product that SSL delivers and the collaborative relationship SSL establishes with its customers. SSL built JCSAT-15 for SkyPerfect JSAT, Asia's largest satellite operator. The spacecraft will be used to meet the growing demand for telecommunications infrastructure in the Asia-Pacific region, providing video distribution, including ultra-high-definition television broadcasting, and data communications service capabilities in Japan and neighboring regions. Once it goes into service, JCSAT-15 will be renamed to JCSAT-110A and will be located at 110 degrees east longitude, where it will replace the NSAT-110 satellite, as well as provide expansion capability. Leveraging the robust SSL 1300 platform, the satellite is designed with the flexibility to adjust its coverage of Japan and the Oceania and Indian Ocean regions to serve the areas with the highest demand. JCSAT-15 is the third satellite that SSL has built for SkyPerfect JSAT, with JCSAT-14 and JCSAT-16 delivered and launched in 2016 and performing well on orbit. SSL is pleased to have worked closely with SkyPerfect JSAT on this program and to deliver the quality satellite that is JCSAT-15. Star 1D1 is a complex multi mission satellite designed and built by SSL for Embratel Star 1, the largest satellite operator in Latin America. Based on the highly flexible SSL 1300 platform, Star 1D1 is equipped with C, KU, and KA band payloads and will serve multiple missions, including telecommunications, television broadcast, broadband, internet access, and other services such as digital inclusion in Brazil and in the Latin American region. The spacecraft is the first of Star One's fourth generation family of satellites and will be the largest and most powerful satellite in the Star One fleet. It is also the second satellite that SSL has built for Star One, with Star One C4 delivered and launched in 2015 and performing well on orbit. SSL is proud to deliver Star 1D1 to Embratel Star 1. SSL thanks and congratulates SkyPerfect JSAT, Embratel Star 1, Ariana Spas, and the SSL team on the delivery of two highly capable satellites, providing services that will improve lives and make the world a better place. While you were watching the film, we were picked up by the next tracking station in the chain. That's on Ascension Island, a tiny island in the South Atlantic, 10 square kilometers, belongs to the UK. NASA had a station there until 1989, and they closed it, and then ESA, the European Space Agency, built its own. It's now run, I believe, by a private English firm. 
There is, there has been and will be a slight loss of the telemetry signal today. It's quite normal. Sometimes it happens. The ground stations suffer a brief blackout due to the launcher's position. Tonight there was a brief loss of the signal between Natal, the Brazilian station, and the Ascension Island station, which has just picked us up. Short loss of a minute, 18 seconds. There will be another between Ascension Island and the Libreville station of 20 seconds. The Libreville station is on the west coast of Africa in Gabon. Now this is quite normal and we don't lose the information. It's a very interesting process that happens. The information is stored on board. In the vehicle equipment bay, that's the white band that you see it's just above the engine burning, there's something called the central telemetry unit. And inside that is something called mass memory. Now the exact times and durations of the signal loss are programmed into this unit and the unit is programmed to record the data it would normally be sending down to the stations on the ground. And it's also programmed to start sending these data when the signal has returned. The upper stage still burning. It'll burn for another nine minutes, roughly. It's responsible for providing the additional and final velocity needed to inject the payload into its orbit. Nice shot of the downrange tracking stations. You can see Ascension picking up the signal now to be followed by our two African stations, Libreville in Gabon in the west and Malindi in Kenya in the east. Europe's space effort is a three-way affair among Isakness and Ariane Space. Our next fame will tell you more about Star 1D1 and the company's relation with Ariane Space. The winning partnership between Ariane Space and Star One has started 30 years ago. Since then, and throughout all these years, Star One has trusted Ariane Space for the launch of its satellites. And we are very happy to be part of Ombratel's success story. Our high specialized engineering team did a great job on monitoring carefully all phases of the construction process, including all integration and tests. Our goal is always to provide a reliable and high-quality service to our customers. This is the 11th launch managed by Embratel Star One with the Ariane Space. The first launch happened in late 1985, and it was the first step of a long history of success between our companies. I would like to thank SSL team for the great job that we have carried out together throughout this program and Ombratel Star One for the continued confidence they put in Ariane Space and in its fleet of launchers. We have now been picked up by the next downrange tracking station. That's the Libreville Gabon station, Africa's west coast. Libreville receives telemetry for 10 to 15 minutes it will see the upper stage burn out. Until Ariane 3, the last downrange station that we had was in Ivory Coast, a place called Akakoro. For Ariane 4, we needed a new station farther east, so we set one up in Libreville, just under the equator. It opened in 1986 and is 30 kilometers from the capital of Gabon. It's been run by the CNES, the French Space Agency, for the past 25 years. If you've been following our mass profile, remember from our original 780 tons at liftoff, we're down now to what? The upper stage, 19 tons. The vehicle equipment bay, 1 ton. The two satellites, 10 tons roughly. An adapter and the SILDA, the carrying structure, roughly, roughly 30 tons, down from 780, and eventually, of course, only the 10 tons of satellite hardware will be orbited. All is well on board. We're in the middle of the upper stage burn. One interesting note, all the systems we've been talking about on the launcher, energy. Il reste moins de cinq minutes de propulsion de l'ESC. They all have a sell-by date. If they're not used by these limits, they get thrown out. There's a similar system on airplanes, which I just learned. There's one in your car and, of course, in the yogurt on your refrigerator. Same thing. This covers everything on Ariane, from turbo pumps to screws. 
It applies in particular to some of the clamp bands that hold the satellites in place inside the fairing because they work with a system of spring compression and the tension in the springs could go lax with time. So it's a very important, often overlooked factor. Both satellites, something else interesting, were powered up before launch at minus 10 hours. To La trajectoire exact. est nominale. There's a debate currently in the industry of whether it's better to launch satellites with power on or off. The four Galileos we launched in November were launched off, as were the skyboxes, the Terabellas. They apparently switched themselves on at separation. They wake themselves up and begin sending their signals. Not the case tonight. La propulsion est nominale. Il reste moins de 4 minutes de propulsion de l'ESC. Our next film will explain the first maneuvers for Star 1 D1 once it is separated. The launch is the first big step to achieve the goal of our mission. In the next 10 days after the launch, there will be some crucial events for the success of the mission, such as deployment of the solar panel, fire the main satellite engine to reach the desired orbit and deployment of the reflectors. Those achievements will be accomplished by SSL and Star One teams, who will be located in Mission Control Center in Palo Alto. As soon as the in-orbit tests are finalized, you'll be able to start the operation of the satellite in order to provide a reliable service to our customers. I would like to thank all Star One, SSL, Ariane Space and CSG people involved in this mission. Good luck and a long and successful life for the one. And that life starts in uh, just about three minutes. Three minutes left in the upper stage burn, cut off to at uh, 2520. The two satellites tonight are flying aboard what we can call the SS Loral Charter, both satellites built by Space Systems Loral. They are the 62nd and 63rd satellites produced by the California Group to be launched by Ariane Space. The two companies have been working together since 1983. And Ariane Space, this year alone, has launched 11 SSL satellites. That's a high number. And there are two more SSL satellites in the Ariane Space Order Book to be launched. And last June, Flight 230 was another SSL charter. You might remember that flight carried Echo Star 18 for the U.S. and Reset for Indonesia. Roughly, oddly enough, the same mass as tonight's double payload. Echo Star weighed 6.3 tons, Reset 3.5 tons. And it's not the first charter this year. We launched an Intelsat charter in August, flight 232, Intelsat 33E, and Intelsat 36. We've been picked up by our last downrange tracking station. That's in Malindi, in Kenya, on Africa's east coast. There are actually two stations here. Just as Ariane 4 needed a new station, so did Ariane 5. So we opened up a new, a fifth tracking station for Ariane 5's second launch. That was back in 1997. And it receives Ariane 5 data the longest for three hours after liftoff. It'll see the upper stage burnout and the satellite separations. And if you are familiar with the Vega launcher, Melindi was also the site of the San Marco launch pad, the Italian launch project that functioned between 1964 and 1988, grew out of the U.S. Scout missile, you might uh, recall, and that was the forerunner of Vega. Coming up on the extinction of the upper stage, they'll be coming in about 20 seconds, and I hear the DDO call out that milestone. On the extreme left is the nozzle, the flame from the upper stage. The white band to the right of that is the vehicle equipment bay. The black bell-shaped structure is what we call the SILDA. It carries the second passenger. Underneath that is JCSAT. And to the right is Star One. And you saw the engine 
shutting down. So the DDM has confirmed the extinction of the upper stage right on time. The powered flight phase of the upper stage ends when the onboard computer judges that the targeted orbit has been attained. So Ariane 5 now has reached her maximum speed. And with the power shut down, our speed will start to drop. And you can see that happening, actually, on the bottom right of your screen. We are moving into the orientation phase. By the time she separates star 1 at plus 29.09, three minutes away, her speed will be about 8.8 .8 kilometers per second. And when she separates JCSAT at plus 43.25, her speed will be down to 6.8 kilometers per second. Tonight's mission is the 283rd for the Arian Space family, and we're delivering the 549th and the 550th satellites. And they are the 125th and 26th to go into geostationary transfer orbit on an Arian 5 since 2002. Star 1D1, before she separated a word, she's the 11th satellite launched by Ariane Space for Amber Tail Star 1. The most recent was Star 1 C4, we launched in July of last year. Star 1 D1 is the first of the fourth generation of Amber Tail Star 1 satellites, also the largest ever built by the company, I believe that was mentioned. Amber Tail Star 1, the biggest regional satellite operator in South America. The two groups, Embratel and Arian Space, have been partners for 30 years, and all 100% of Embratel satellites have been launched by Arian Space. We mentioned that the upper stage has a dual role, propulsion and ballistic. Well, the propulsion part is over, and she is carrying out her second role now. We're in what we call the coasting phase. You can also call it the free-flying phase. We are coasting, but that doesn't mean nothing's happening. The composite, and you can see it there, is being maneuvered and spun in a series of roughly 20 operations. They range in time from a few seconds to a few moments, to a few minutes, I should say. What we have to do during this period is separate the first satellite in one direction and one altitude. And then we separate the SILDA in a second direction and a second altitude, higher usually. And finally, we separate the final or second passenger in a third direction and another altitude even higher than that. Now, how do we do this, you are asking? Well, the attitude and control system uses a series of small thrusters. You might be able to see them popping on and off on the outside of the vehicle there on the animation. They're orienting the composite in the directions required by the first satellite. Separation star one D1. Well, look at that. Happy people from Embertil Star One. The DDU has confirmed separation of the first satellite. That's good news. You notice the people in the hall very politely holding their applause. Because the mission is not over, we will separate our lower passenger, JCSAT-15, in about 14 minutes. But the first good news for our friends from Brazil is Star 1D1. You can see her making her way away from the mothership, pushed by a series of springs, and she'll be making her way to her orbital position. Here are her first post-separation maneuvers, what they also call the positive chronology. First acquisition will be by the Australian station at Minganu, and I hope I'm saying that right. That'll be at 11 minutes after separation. Then the solar array deployment will come after 180 minutes. There will be three Apogee motor firings on the first, second, and third days out. Reflector deployment will come in six days, and then again on the eighth day. And finally, station acquisition in nine days.
with the first passenger separated, the composite, and you can see it, is being spun up to a different altitude and in a different direction for release of the silda. That's the black bit on the right side, the carrying structure that lets us have a second satellite. Star 1 was released at 1,308 kilometers, and the silda will be jettisoned at over 1,800 kilometers up and in another direction, mainly to avoid collision. The silda due to be separated at plus 31.57 in one minute from now. And after that, the composite will be oriented again a third time toward a third direction and an even higher altitude for release of JSET 15. JSET will be separated at just under 4,700 kilometers up again to avoid any risk of collision. All this carried out by the thrusters. There are 12 of them. They can move the composite in any direction, yaw, pitch, and roll. This is how the upper stage performs all these attitude maneuvers to separate the spacecraft and the SILDA in the most precise spot exactly where they should be. All this, of course, programmed in advance. Separation du SILDA. And there's separation of the SILDA. And you'll see it's pushed away from the mothership exactly the same system, series of springs that pushes it away from the mothership. Ariane 5, known, of course, for its double launches. We mentioned that. She's the only commercial launcher capable of lifting two heavy satellites. And we have done hundreds of double launches. Each one requires something called the SILDA. And there are seven versions of it, ranging in height from just under 5 meters to 6.4 meters. JCSAT-15 is now being spun into position for her separation. That's due at plus 43 minutes, about 11 minutes away. JCSAT-15 is the 19th Sky Perfect JSAT satellite launched by Ariane Space. It will replace NSAT-110, which was launched in October of 2000, on an Ariane 4, Flight 133. Sky Perfect JSET Corporation, Asia's largest satellite operator, a fleet of 17 satellites. And Ariane Space last launched for the company in May of 2012. That was Flight 206, JSET 13. And that satellite, by the way, weighed 4.5 tons, so you see they're getting heavier. Ariane Space is a very big player in Japan. As of last November, Ariane Space had launched 27 satellites into geostationary transfer orbit for Japanese operators, 18 for Sky Perfect JSET, 9 for BSAT. We launch roughly one a year for the nation, and two more Japanese satellites are in the Ariane Space order book to be launched. Ariane Space has maintained nearly 70% market share, 7.0 in Japan since launching the country's very first commercial satellite, JCSAT-1, in 1989. That was Flight 29 on an Ariane 4, and that JCSAT-1 weighed only 2.2 tons, so they're getting bigger as time goes by. We're coming up on another short film on JCSAT. You can learn about their relationship with Ariane Space. The mission integration activities for JCSAT-15, which has spanned over a little more than two years, have gone very smoothly. The Space System Laurel 1300 platform is very well known by our teams, as JCSAT-15 is the seventh satellite in this series to be launched from Kourou this year. I much appreciate the hard work and the professional effort of the Allianz Space and the Guiana Space Center and the SSL team for this launch campaign. Separation of our second passenger due in about eight minutes. Separation, of course, marks an end as well as a beginning. It's the end of the launch vehicle's mission for the satellite, but it also marks the start of the satellite's own life. Before explaining how a satellite is separated, first an idea of how it's attached to the upper stage. 
a satellite, basically a cylinder, a big box. The cylinder is fixed on an adapter by a clamp, which encircles the cylinder and keeps the satellite in place on the adapter. Separation is triggered by the clamp which is cut at one point and loosens and this frees the satellite from the adapter and releases eight springs which push the satellite forward. And You saw that earlier. When the satellite moves away from the composite, this activates two switches signaling the separation and this information is transmitted to the ground and it's this information that we get that we will get in a few minutes for JCSAT 15. After separation of our second passenger, the composite will be spun up again in a different direction for what's called passivation. This involves emptying the first the liquid oxygen tank and then the liquid hydrogen tank of any remaining fuel. This takes place at a much higher altitude, over 75 kilometers up, and represents the very end of the Ariane mission, but it's something we will not see, unfortunately. It has been a big year for Ariane Space. 11 launches, 7 Ariane 5s, 2 Soyuz, and 2 Vegas. Our next short film will explain the first maneuvers on JC set after her separation. After the JCSAT 15 separation from the launch vehicle, we plan to perform the orbit raising operation from its transfer orbit to the geosynchronous orbit. Then the JCSAT 15 payload in orbit testing will begin <coughs> in 10 days or so from the launch. The Guyana Space Center, Europe's spaceport, was certified ISO 14001 in 2004, which means the activities meet the international environmental standards. This includes everything, everything that goes on in the technical center, Jupiter, where we are, in the payload preparation units, on the test bench for the solid boosters, in the propellant destruction facilities, and the impact of the launch vehicle itself. Certification was renewed in 2008 and again in 2011. The Guyana site was chosen in 1964 among 14 possibilities, including Australia and Scandinavia, when France wanted to build a new base. They found everything here they wanted, a large opening on the ocean. We have 50 kilometers of coastline here to make possible flying both north and east for polar and geostationary orbits a low population density, nearness to the equator. The site is also free from hurricanes and earthquakes. And they found also nearby hills where they can put telemetry facilities. And we're going to go to a place on the nearby hill called the CVI, the Quick Look Telemetry Display Center. During the world flight, the launcher transmits telemetry to different ground stations all along its flight path. Data collected in the telemetry flow allow to post-process the reaction of the launcher in post-flight analysis to confirm its flawless behavior during the world flight and to authorize the following launch. For this purpose, the telemetry contains every parameter treated by the onboard computer and coming from thousands of sensors mounted on the launcher. All this information is centralized and elaborated on board the launcher by the UCTM and sent to the ground by radio frequency emission. The telemetry is received by parabolic antennas pre-processed in station and a little selection of the data flow is transferred by satellite telecommunication link right away to write the node of direct telemetry processing, the SCET, located in Galil. The SCET, which means System de Centralisation et d'Exploitation des Télémesures, processes in real time data coming from stations. Jérôme Mons from Telespazio is the SCET responsible for this flight. It allows the acquisition, recording and timing of the CVI data flow. For visualization needs, extracted data are used by the flight safety and the CVI team. That includes engine parameters, key events of the flight sequence, attitude of the launcher. 
Measurements of the initial platform unit are also sent to the CSG in order to supply the localization system with relevant information. These information are operated by two end users, the flight safety and we, the CVI team. CVI means Control Visual Immediate. These consoles are dedicated to propulsion observation. They display the engine's main parameters, pump and tank pressure, turbine rotating speed, in order to check the behavior of the launcher during the propelled phases. Benoît Mazelier from CNES is the specialist in charge for this flight. Stéphane Le Boucher from Airbus Safran Launcher will monitor the attitude console for this flight. These screens present the activation of the launcher control system and their results on the attitude parameters during the world flight. We can therefore verify the flawless execution of all predicted maneuvers. This workstation is a trajectory one. It enables the comparison to the predicted flight until the end of propelled phases. Alexandre Dallonneau is the Ariane Space Mission Analysis responsible of this flight. At the end of the mission, it will produce the orbit and attitude diagnosis for the customers. And finally, this is the supervision console for the CVI manager. It displays the acceleration of the launcher, the propulsion mains parameters and the key events of the flight, like stages and spacecraft separations, engine cutoff. In real time, the CVI manager summarizes the information coming from all the CVI team members and reports to the launch campaign authorities. One minute to go till separation of JCSAT-15, so don't go anywhere. The CVI teams have all the means for receiving, processing, storing, and analyzing data coming in from the ground stations along the flight path. Right now, as you saw, they're following all the key flight data and they're reporting that data to the teams here in Jupiter. And later, these data are treated to reconstitute the entire mission. The flight is recreated in figures from liftoff to well after satellite separation. There will be a CVI post-flight analysis tomorrow here in Kourou. Then in January, another one at Ariane Space Headquarters in Evry. We're awaiting confirmation of separation of our second passenger, JCSAT-15, in about 20 seconds. Again, a moment of high concentration. Tonight represents years of work for many people here. Separation, JCSAT-15. And there we are. The Well, you heard the applause. The final good news, Ariane 5 has delivered her second passenger, the last of the year, JCSAT 15. So for those, well, focused, we won't say tense moments, just minutes ago, you can see the change here in Jupiter. And this is what it looks like up there. As again, the satellite pushed away from the mothership, soon to begin her life. Everyone in Jupiter here very buoyant and all across the Space Center and at all the points and posts where people are following the launcher and the satellite. Work is just beginning or soon will be. Well, maybe after the holidays and the funny hats, work will be beginning or soon will be at the different ground stations for both Star 1 and JCSAT and at the other sites around the world where the satellite's first maneuvers are being monitored. We're waiting, of course, for the traditional post-separation speeches. I believe we're also waiting for confirmation that JSAT-15 signal has been properly received by its Korean station at Kumsan. That may take uh, five minutes or so. So we're waiting for that confirmation. What should happen? judging from the past, is that the JCSAT satellite mission director will receive the confirmation by phone, is my guess, but I could be wrong. He would then relay it to Ariane Space. Sometimes they relay it 
by using the phone. Sometimes they simply say it out loud or the satellite director gets up and walks over to Stefan Israel's desk. I've seen all, all options. In any case, once the signal reception is confirmed, then Stefan Israel will make his way back out up on this side of the Jupiter building and announce it to us in the hall. You can see the red lights on the Santa Claus hats, the Christmas hats flickering in the half darkness inside the fishbowl. And Stefan Israel is, I believe, ready to make his way out to the podium? No. Coming up. We're going to go to another replay. Another replay. We should have a few. While we're waiting for confirmation and for the speeches, JCSAT's first operations will be first acquisition of the signal in seven minutes. That's at the Kumsan Korea station. I believe that's what we're waiting for, a confirmation of that. Another replay as we continue with the first uh, early orbit phase operations. There will be a second acquisition at 12 minutes.